May we come to order, please? May we come to order? Thank you very much. You will recall yesterday morning that um, I had the honor of being introduced by David Eisenhower, uh, my fellow piece of furniture, which is to say co-chair uh, of the FPRI's History Institute. Uh, and um, I have not the opportunity to return the honor uh, of introducing David this morning. I, David Eisenhower and I uh, go back really all the way to the mid-60s when we were students together at Amherst College. And we were reunited when I moved from Berkeley to the University of Pennsylvania in 1988, and David was already there. And so it's been now 18 years uh, that we've been together uh, at Penn and uh, at the FPRI and developed uh, uh, very close friendship as well as uh, uh, being colleagues uh, at Penn and FPRI. And all I can say is that I have just learned a tremendous amount from David. I, I cannot even express the depth that I owe him uh, in terms of my, the depth of my, whatever, whatever depth of understanding I have of the way the real world works uh, in terms of politics, history, and baseball, I might add. Um, uh, much of it I owe to, to David. Uh, he is uh, a um, uh, instructor at the, uh, and a, fe a fellow at the Annenberg School of Communications at Penn, where he directs the Institute for Public Service, as well as being a senior fellow at FPRI. Uh, it says on the bi biography here uh, in your handout that he teaches communications and the presidency, that which is about the most bland way uh, you could possibly express what David does. He has developed uh, entirely on his own, I think, one of the most powerful educational um, uh, pedagogical approaches uh, that I've ever encountered in my career as a, as a professor uh, in terms of teaching rhetoric, the use of language, the intersection between words and power, uh, and the methods by which we can deconstruct, or get behind, or understand the ways in which political figures try to communicate with the multiple audiences that they always have whenever they uh, may uh, engage in, 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 in public discourse. Um, and um, we, we have talked at such length and so often about so many different subjects that we cross-fertilize each other, and sometimes I'm not sure whether the idea I'm claiming is really David's, uh, and perhaps it's sometimes it occurs the other way around as well. But uh, today, his topic is uh, World War II and its meaning for Americans, and in that regard, perhaps the best introduction to give him is to say uh, that he is the author of the highly acclaimed uh, encyclopedic and yet very readable uh, book, Eisenhower at War, 1943-45. So please help me uh, welcome David Eisenhower. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Walter. Uh, and uh, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen here this morning, uh, World War II and its meaning for Americans uh, being my topic is a subject about which all of us have views. Uh, and I appreciate this opportunity uh, here at this uh, conference on our final day to state mine and to state my views in the company of uh, uh, fellow teachers. I think I was surprised all day yesterday uh, to hear <coughs> uh, so many suggestions that military history is being downgraded on our campuses uh, and that uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a growing gap between the military and civilian uh, cultures uh, in our country, and that we are faced, as uh, Colonel Herbert said yesterday, with uh, a kind of uh, erasure of national memory in these very key ways. I think the one thing that I can certainly uh, do today is uh, perhaps not uh, define a meaning for World War II, which is uh, a subject that is so vast with so many uh, meanings that no single meaning uh, would be possible, but uh, together uh, perhaps find a basis uh, for affirming our resolve uh, to teach uh, these critical subjects and to prevent this erasure of national memory as we go about our professions as teachers. When I reached high school, and was old enough to ask questions about the war. 
And I found that my grandfather was very reticent to talk about it. Uh, and yet, I was surrounded uh, by the books on World War II that uh, he uh, accumulated. He kept up with the literature on World War II. Uh, and I grew up, and this was one of the privileges of my life, surrounded by his associates uh, in World War II who were frequent uh, visitors to the farm. He encouraged me to watch the lengthy war documentary produced by NBC uh, and based on his memoir, Crusade in Europe. In fact, I took afternoons out at Gettysburg to watch this film. In short, uh, he was eager, I believe, uh, for me and my sisters and my family uh, to learn about World War II so as to understand him better, to understand better the millions who served in the war, uh, and to consider what that war meant for all of us. In an eventful century, in Dwight Eisenhower's mind, in an eventful century, World War II was decisive, a decisive event. His life spanned most of the 20th century, and this is a time of unprecedented innovation offset by uh, the Great Depression uh, and the legacies of very destructive wars. It was a time of very turbulent change, probably more qualitative change now, he was born in 1890, and that generation probably uh, experienced more qualitative change in their lives than any generation ever, including our own. Dwight Eisenhower was born in the horse and buggy era. His hometown in Abilene, uh, and the setting that the Eisenhower family chose in moving to Abilene was an effort uh, really to preserve a way of life uh, which had been um, more or less continuous and unbroken and similar in character, dating all the way back to the uh, uh, 17th century, uh, when the Eisenhower, late 17th century, when the Eisenhowers arrive uh, in America. And yet, by the time that Dwight Eisenhower, and yet, by the time that uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a teenager, Automobiles were appearing in great numbers. The Wright brothers had pioneered flight, uh, perhaps the most visible innovation that transformed America into an economic, industrial, and military superpower in the 20th century. As a soldier, his career would span the era of horse-drawn artillery, the slow and noisy tanks making their appearance in World War I. He was a tank trainer uh, throughout World War I at Camp Colt in Gettysburg the advent of air power and modern naval ships, and ultimately the detonation of atomic weapons in 1945. After the war, at the pinnacle of influence and prestige, he would live to see the computer age, the television, the television age, uh, super highways, uh, and the space age, and yet of all the turning points and revolutions that he saw in his life, uh, none matched, in his view, World War II. The interval between 1942 and 1945 was, in his mind, not only the defining moment of his life, of course, as it had been in the lives of millions of Americans who fought in Europe and in the Far East, he regarded his wartime service as his most important contribution to our nation. He was far more important, in his view, than the two terms that he served as President of the United States from 1953 to 1961. One of my favorite stories that I uh, heard from my great uncle Milton Eisenhower, I think makes the point uh, probably as dramatic uh, as any. In 1954, when Dr. Milton Eisenhower was president of Penn State, uh, he hosted his brother, President Eisenhower, uh, for the delivery of the commencement address uh, <clears throat> uh, that year. Uh, Penn State is huge, and as the hour for the address approached, the rains came and the massive event uh, was going to have to be pushed indoors, a massive logistical undertaking. A slightly panic-stricken Milton apologized to Ike for the pandemonium and the makeshift arrangements, whereupon Ike smiled, quote, Milton, since June 6, 1944, I have never worried about the rain. <laughs> World War II was, in short, decisive. The legacy of World War II was positive. Uh, <clears throat> As I say, uh, I concur that 
uh, parenthetically in yesterday's uh, presentations that to speculate in this vein, that is about the wider meanings of the war, it requires, I believe, uh, a certain amount of preparation and background. Uh, to do so cannot be done without exposure uh, to the broad principles of military science, as Colonel uh, Herbert uh, argued. Uh, the topic, as Rick Atkinson said last night, may be on the back burner of uh, publishing list charts uh, right now and on the uh, back burner for bestseller lists. And yet, uh, I think we were all glad to hear last night that Rick Atkinson continues uh, with his trilogy on World War II, and we must continue to teach the subject. The search for meaning uh, about World War II, I think, is uh, really endless. I think the potential meanings of World War II are uh, unlimited. I think that uh, students should be provided with the means to ask questions uh, about uh, World War II. But in principle, the meanings of World War II are as varied as the individuals uh, who fought it. Those who fought World War II or lived through that period are always and forever, I believe, the most important source of understanding the meaning uh, of that conflict. The gold standard for interpreting uh, World War II uh, in a speech or presentation, I believe, is provided by Ronald Reagan uh, at an address at uh, the Omaha Beach Cer uh, Cemetery in June of 1984, uh, in which he uh, delivered a, uh, a set of addresses, actually. He addressed uh, the Pontu Hoc, or veterans at the Pontu Hoc, and then moved on to the Omaha Beach uh, Cemetery. Uh, this is a, a duo of speeches that uh, probably secured uh, his re-election in 1984, and I think they can be seen in, hinds in hindsight as far more than ceremonial addresses, uh, but uh, speeches that had a sort of transformational quality about them as well. Well, he discourses on the meaning of World War II, and he begins with extended quotes from, from the correspondence between a soldier uh, who landed at Omaha Beach with the 1st Division, uh, a private Zanata, and his daughter, uh, Lisa Zanata Hen. Uh, and he quotes uh, the veterans of, of D-Day as the ultimate source uh, of meaning uh, of that conflict. It's only after that Reagan had done so that he ventured uh, his own interpretation of the meaning of World War II, which was uh, extravagant. His speeches in Normandy in 1984 argue, in effect, if carefully interpreted, that World War II had saved the West, and that the imminent end of the Cold War, as he saw it in 1984, would prove that fact. Ronald Reagan's, as I say, interpretation of the meaning of World War II is extravagant. Dwight Eisenhower's was less extravagant uh, in a interview with Walter Cronkite in 1963, uh, filmed in Normandy and on the beaches uh, of Normandy. He returned uh, for broad broadcast in the summer of 1964, the 20th anniversary of D-Day. Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower said that victory in World War II gave the Western allies in the democracies a chance uh, to win complete and ultimate victory. But I think the one thing that Eisenhower and Reagan would have agreed upon is that World War II had a positive meaning. I think that's important to bear in mind, and in light of yesterday's presentations, that it has a positive meaning uh, for Americans, perhaps identifies it as an exception in the 20th century. All of us, I believe, last night enjoyed uh, visiting the McCormick Estate. It struck more than one of us that Robert McCormick considered Cantini and his service on the line in World War I to be the high point of his life. And isn't it interesting that he would go on to champion the America First cause of non-intervention in 1938, 1939, and 1940 in the face of the same threat uh, that he had confronted in 1917 and 1918. McCormick's experience in the Great War and the conclusions that he reached about that conflict are not only understandable, but they were in some sense shared by even the strongest advocates of intervention, including Franklin Roosevelt. I've been reading a, a book recently uh, <clears throat> which quotes uh, Franklin Roosevelt before he was elected in 1932 as uh, 
opining that the uh, America's decision in 1917 to intervene on beside of the Allies was uh, perhaps a mistake. Of course, even mistakes uh, create their realities, uh, and he's faced with a different reality created by that mistake if it was a mistake. But the th fact of a mistake is what uh, uh, determines uh, uh, McCormick's initial uh, response to the question of intervention in 1939 and 1940. In the summer of 1999, uh, my father was at work on a book called Yanks, and he asked me to accompany him on his last research trip to France, uh, where we would uh, tour the San Miguel Mers Argonne sectors. Uh, sectors, of course, where the first division fought. It turned out, interestingly, to be the very trip that his father had taken him on exactly 70 years before when wrapping up uh, his work, Dwight Eisenhower's work, on the American Battle Monuments Commission under General Pershing. This was a very uh, important episode in Dwight Eisenhower's life. Uh, <clears throat> he uh, conducted uh, a major survey and study of the U.S. battlefields of World War I. Well, this was a great trip. In fact, it was one of the most interesting trips of my life. I came back with a second guidebook, interestingly, uh, covering the Verdun battle itself. Now, the Verdun battle was a battle that uh, technically U.S. forces were not involved in, though we fought in the vicinity of Verdun. Verdun refers to the six-month campaign in 1916 between the French and German armies in which one million French and Germans died in a struggle for control of a 750-yard sector of that front. There is a French and British foundation which publishes the guidebook that I am referring to, and it opens with a letter to visitors. And the letter reads, the French and German Verdun Foundation maintains this battlefield so that the scene of this struggle will always be preserved and so that future generations can come here and ponder the question, how it was that our two governments could have per permitted this to happen. That describes a meaningless war, and yet a meaningless tragedy on the scale of World War I cannot fail but to generate new meanings because it generates malevolence on an equal scale and a debate about the consequences of World War I which will rage until the need to act became unmistakable and immediate as it did in 1941. World War II, in other words, in contrast to World War I, is a clear-cut victory uh, for America. I think it is uh, important to recognize that. I think that it makes studying its lessons and understanding its, uh, 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 its history a very meaningful and I would say vital exercise uh, in light of the trend and the uh, thrust of most American scholarship and I would say punditry, uh, which often emphasizes uh, the negative about our history. Unlike World War I, World War II highlights the positive about this country. World War II, in fact, uh, generally provides occasions in which Americans grant themselves permission to reflect positively on their history. Americans do not do this routinely. Uh, we are accustomed to going about our lives in a state of earnest concern about the manifold problems uh, facing our public figures. Uh, we are constantly reminded that we are beset by social, political, and cultural divides, that America is a 50-50 nation, that American history is a tragedy to be redeemed, not a story to be celebrated, that there are many miles to travel and many promises to keep. I think it is fair to ask how many Americans have not lived, if informed critics are to be believed, under the most corrupt government in their history? How many times uh, are we on the verge of seeing American policies bringing us and the world to shame, disaster, and, and discredit? Indeed, I would say that our recent history, including World War II, can be chronicled as a long series of setbacks and mistakes which are punctuated by stunning and complete victories which seem to catch informed Americans by surprise. And yet, I think 
that it is important to recognize that Americans understand themselves to be fortunate. Americans are envied, they are creative, they are restless, they are optimistic, and they are unwilling to exchange places with anyone, anywhere. And I think World War II uh, certainly illustrates truths that account for that fact. But this paradoxical truth uh, about our recent history, I believe, will interest historians as far into the future as we can anticipate. Imagine 300 years from now or 500 years from now, historians uh, will look back on America in the 1940s and today, and I think that they will see that this interval is perhaps not as wide uh, as we perceive it at the moment. Somewhere between 1945 and 2007, uh, they may situate the origins of globalization. Uh, they may see the emergence of patterns in government and business, which three to 500 years from now might be taken for granted. The implications and the lessons of American dynamism will be explored, and World War II certainly illustrates provides an instance for appreciating American dynamism. In the context of World War II history, I think the fact of American dynamis dynamism can be summed up by a single fateful strategic and military fact. And that is that looking back to the 1943-1944 period, whereas a German invasion of England across the 25 mile wide channel was a fanciful, in fact impossible concept and to stretch the imagination slightly, whereas a Russian, a German, a Japanese, Chinese, or even British invasion in strength of any place in North or South America would have been unthinkable, Americans thought little of mobilizing 15 million men and women and of transporting them across the seas to hurl them against the finest armies of Eurasia, 4,000 and 8,000 miles from home. It would be ironic, in fact tragic, that what should be so apparent to future historians would be missed or forgotten by us. Today's news mostly features uh, the latest problems, uh, the erosion of wartime and post-war partnerships, uh, the malaise of NATO, our estrangement from the United Nations, the problem of working out exit strategies uh, to salvage what a sizable number of people see as yet another Vietnam, uh, and in light of this, once again, Americans are being Americans. This is the way we choose to think and communicate about ourselves. And I think in this context, the positive story of World War II is not only something that uh, ought to be recalled and recalled in a spirit uh, perhaps of uh, self-congratulation, but is something that should be studied for practical reasons, to try to understand what it is about America that was able to achieve uh, a victory of this dimensions. I also think that um, uh, World War II has uh, other meanings, not just simply the dynamism of America. An escapable meaning is the way that the Second World War demonstrates the possibilities of international cooperation, international uh, political and military cooperation. Uh, if NATO is permitted to break down or if the United States finds itself uh, permanently estranged from the European Union uh, these days, perhaps uh, World War II uh, will not have proven that fact. But again, uh, the demonstration of World War II of this principle that uh, we have uh, links with other people that are more important uh, than our differences with other people uh, the demonstration of this truth in World War II is very powerful, and I believe that the example of World War II will prevail over time. One of history's more, more interesting lessons is how long it takes the verdicts of history uh, to establish themselves and to take hold. Uh, it stands to reason that when a decisive event happens, uh, that people will draw the logical conclusions and adjust accordingly, and yet facts suggest otherwise. In our first uh, session this morning, we were talking about the American Civil War, a very interesting session. Um, I am somebody who has been exposed to this all of my life. I grew up in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And one thing I knew about Gettysburg, which is a town and area of monuments, not until July 1963 
100 years after the Battle of Gettysburg was fought, did Alabama and a number of other southern states contribute a monument to the Alabamians who had fought at Gettysburg, figuratively bringing that battle to a close? You would think it had been otherwise. Uh, roughly, chronologically, our relationship with, uh, say, World War II, and uh, uh, if one were to count forward from the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, perhaps an analogy could be drawn with the 1920s uh, in America. Uh, how did Americans perceive the uh, Civil War in the 1920s? Well, by the 1920s, Americans were trying very hard to forget wars and to forget the Civil War in particular. The new birth of freedom that Lincoln had talked about at Gettysburg, which is America's 19th century Normandy, had degenerated into Jim Crow, disenfranchisement, and, and economic malaise throughout the American South, which remained outside of the American mainstream. Well, as I say, by a, it took 100 years uh, for the lessons of the American Civil War to really register. What I remember about that summer, 1963, is that on hand to officiate at the dedication of the Alabama Monument was Governor George Corley Wallace of Alabama. He continued to wage bitter end resistance to the lessons of the American Civil War for another 20 years. But then he would finally and sincerely see the light. Dwight Eisenhower's background, I believe, reinforces this point about international cooperation, and I think I should emphasize it, because uh, the main facts of Dwight Eisenhower's life, and this is my closest contact and inspiration in approaching this subject, what stands out about his life are the incongruities and unlikelihoods which abound in his biography and background. In 1911, uh, <clears throat> When he left his hometown of Abilene for good, embarking for West Point in a career that would send him to 30 duty stations around the world, I think the last thing on his mind uh, was uh, the idea that he would achieve uh, great things and assignments overseas. Dwight Eisenhower was somebody who uh, uh, was a typical American. He was somebody who wanted a free education, uh, second, only secondarily a military education. He wanted to escape the tedium of his hometown. Uh, last summer, Julie and I, or two summers ago, Julie and I and Melanie uh, <clears throat> took a drive out west. Uh, we've driven the country several times. We drove through Abilene again, and we were reminded again that there are a few places in America that are more remote from the cosmopolitan centers uh, of the U.S. seaboards and the cities overseas where Dwight Eisenhower and his contemporaries would perform uh, their greatest achievements. Yet in the final analysis, as Dwight Eisenhower walked through this great adventure, uh, particularly the last 25 years of his life, he always insisted that people in Abilene are the same, pe same as people everywhere. Uh, people everywhere, like people from Abilene, go about their daily lives, they strive, they pursue, their personal goals and interests, they raise families, make friends, uh, they try to make their fortunes, uh, they take time out, precious time out, to think about the wider, wider world beyond. They are capable of change, and they want change for the better. This is something that uh, he found in common with everybody that he came into contact with throughout his life. Uh, change, uh, the willingness to change. This is something that's at issue in the Middle East today, but Americans have stood for change, and World War II stands for change. And Dwight Eisenhower's life and time, his biography, represents change in every way. In fact, there was no Dwight David Eisenhower raised in Abilene in the 1890s. Uh, my grandfather was born and christened David Dwight Eisenhower. When he entered West Point in June of 1911, he switched his first and second names because he liked the sound, Dwight David, better than David Dwight. That was a typical thing to do in those days. When he registered at West Point, he lists Tyler, Texas as his birthplace instead of Denison, Texas, because it's better to be from Tyler. <laughs> and Americans were none the wiser, and that too was a typical thing to do. When he registered at West Point in the fall of 1911, he omitted the fact that he had played pro ball in the KOM League in 1909 and 1910, figuring that West Point would be none the wiser and he would be therefore eligible for football. That is not an apocryphal story. In fact, it is true. Uh, <clears throat> Red Patterson, who invented the tape measure home run, 
uh, in the late 1940s as a PR fellow for the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, told me, I actually went to a ball game with Red Patterson in the, in the late 1970s and he told a story about uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower and all of this uh, mystery about his uh, background and uh, this uh, sort of a changeable uh, uh, figure. Uh, uh, he accompanied, he was assigned to accompany the Army Chief of Staff uh, to the Polo Grounds uh, uh, for a Dodgers uh, Giants game and with Dwight Eisenhower, who was then dressed in uniform, this is 1947, he says, uh, you know, there are a lot of rumors about you. Uh, there are rumors that you played uh, Class D ball in the KOM League in 1909, 1910 under the alias of, uh, of Wilson. Sir, our records show that there were two Wilsons in that league. Which one were you? And Grant had replied, the one that could hit. <laughs> <laughs> a lot not known about him. Uh, his uh, biography, the background, early life shows that what he was interested was was uh, in, in moving ahead uh, and utilizing such advantages as he could muster in order to move ahead. Dwight Eisenhower was, in other words, as Kansan and as American as they came, and he remained so as he advanced through West Point in his military career, striving along to exhibit the values of his uh, alma mater, West Point, duty, honor, country. He rose in the service of Douglas MacArthur and George Marshall, men whose challenges, the great challenge in the mid-20th century, was to wage coalition warfare and to master the revolutionary factors in warfare and international affairs, which have been covered in yesterday's sessions. Among the key strategic realities faced by American leadership was the fact that our objectives in World War II could not be achieved by American power alone. Coalition warfare was new for the United States, but essential in those times and in a conflict waged on that scale. Harmonizing political and military aims within a diverse coalition requiring consensus and understanding between, beyond the letter of agreements were overriding tasks that befell Eisenhower's command. And yet I believe that history records that the American, British, French, and Polish forces in World War II in Europe fought as a single army no one emerged knowing better the critical importance of international cooperation or more profoundly aware of the possibility of cooperation, a lesson that he conveyed in large ways and in small ways. I was reading last night my copy of At Ease. He relates one of his favorite memories, and this involved the King and Queen of England. On the 26th of May, 1944, and he recalled this story, during the final days in planning and preparations in London for the great invasion of Europe, he recalled that he took time out to pay a call on King George and Queen Elizabeth at Buckingham Palace, a memorable moment, to say the least. I don't think very many historians have grasped Dwight Eisenhower's reverence for the English royal family, which had honored him with friendship and hospitality throughout the war, throughout the war. and yet he was apprehensive that day, uh, and apprehensive every time he approached uh, the king, the king afflicted by ill health since youth, was notoriously quiet and shy and hampered by a speech impediment, which meant, which, uh, meant that dealing with him was uh, always somewhat awkward. Staff remembers how, uh, members remembered how the king and Eisenhower in Tunisia had once ridden in a jeep together for several hours in complete silence, in complete silence. But in late May 1944, just days before the invasion, uh, the king was gregarious and in top form. Over lunch served in buffet style in an upstairs apartment the three reminisced. The Queen told Eisenhower for the first time about something that had happened on a tour of when, uh, when Eisenhower had taken a tour of Windsor Castle in 1942, a visit that had been arranged for him. It turned out that, uh, and the Queen tells uh, my grandfather this, that uh, Colonel Sterling, who was uh, Eisenhower and Mark Clark's guide, had forgotten to tell the uh, King and Queen that there were visitors on the ground. And so the couple had been sipping tea in a garden when they suddenly heard the group approaching. Not wanting to intrude, the king and queen of England had knelt on their hands and knees behind the hedge until the Americans and Sterling passed by. Eisenhower was delighted, and when he heard that story, the three shared a good laugh. Back at headquarters, Eisenhower described the luncheon to his closest aide. During the dessert course, he told Harry Butcher, he had not noticed that his napkin had fallen to the floor, yet he felt no self-consciousness or embarrassment when the king had mentioned it to him. Quote, it could have been like visiting a friend in Abilene, he remarked. 
And he felt that. He felt a great kinship uh, with British, Britishers at all levels. As he said in his Guildhall address, kinship among nations is not determined in such measurements as proximity, size, and age. Rather, we should turn to those inner things, those intangibles that are the real treasures that free men possess, and that if we keep our eyes on this guidepost, then no difficulties along our path of mutual cooperation can ever be insurmountable. Historians, I think, evaluate uh, Eisenhower's uh, achievement in World War II as harmonizing uh, political and military objectives, and that is one way of putting it. Uh, I think that, that is probably a misnomer. I've asked myself many times what it was that uh, was key to Dwight Eisenhower's success as a coalition commander. And um, I thought that yesterday's presentations about, uh, about the sort of hierarchy or terminology that we should uh, grasp and uh, teaching military science and so forth uh, was very important. Um, the key to Eisenhower's success, I believe, in the European theater is that he recognized that strategic differences were just that. The attitude that he took into his dealings with coalition partners is that the aims accepted by the Allied governments in the unconditional formula presupposed a strategy that must logically stem from it. In other words, uh, not that he would have to reconcile differences of opinion Dwight Eisenhower uh, uh, adopted as an operating assumption that the various sides uh, in his command were in fact united and would in fact unite uh, behind strategy as they had uh, behind objectives since strategy was a logical extension uh, of objectives. World War II also has great meaning in terms of citizenship uh, the First Division Museum, where we are today, uh, Cantini, I thought we all enjoyed those exhibits last night, uh, which uh, are a very vivid, uh, I suppose, uh, display of what citizenship in the 1940s required. It allowed us to imagine uh, what uh, the GIs must have gone through uh, in the First Division as they approached uh, the shores, an exercise that my wife and I uh, were actually able to do some years ago when we toured the region and visited the places uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, come up in the, in the uh, invasion story. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, uh, we visited uh, all the towns along the uh, invasion front uh, from San Mary Glace uh, through the British and Canadian beaches that stretch eastward. These sites stand as monuments to the ingenuity, bravery, and the highest ideals of citizenship which the Allied soldiers of World War II were called upon to exemplify. We visited, uh, and I would recommend uh, to anybody uh, in this area to take time out to tour southern England, the 101st Airborne Bivouac Area, where Granddad had dropped in on the troops to wish them Godspeed hours before the D-Day attack. We saw Suffolk House, which is still an active Royal Navy station, where Eisenhower and his deputies met continuously in the final hours before D-Day. Today, the hills surrounding Portsmouth are peaceful, and yet the mind's eye can imagine uh, a time when the caravans of vehicles streamed south towards the docks winding past quaint country homes where tea for sale signs were posted and GIs passed through the narrow streets of towns where villagers stepped out to wave goodbye and good luck. This is a great moment in our history, and there have been very few such moments in world history that can compare with it. A vivid vignette of this period involves the British Admiral Bertram Ramsey, commander of the Dunkirk evacuation, who by the spring of 1944 uh, advanced British strategic views in Supreme Headquarters. He is also serving as commander of the Allied Naval Forces on D-Day. A week before the attack, and this is a description of him that appears in the Eisenhower papers, Ramsey and his driver pulled over to the side of a road on a promontory overlooking uh, Portsmouth and where the invasion force was gathering. Ramsey looked on, out pensively at this scene for what seemed like quite a while to his driver. Obviously, he was thinking about the great test ahead. Had everything been done? What would the next few days bring? Would the Allied forces 
meet the test of battle against the Nazis. Quote, it is a tragic situation, he's quoted as saying, that this is a scene of a stage set for terrible human sacrifice. But if out of it comes peace and happiness, who would have it otherwise? What kinds of qualities sustained this cause? As Walter mentioned, I'm a believer in the importance of speech. I believe that speech is a reliable window on history, among other things. And so each semester at Penn, uh, in this program that I am administering, I review, I don't assign it, I review perhaps the greatest political speech of them all, one that Professor Ray uh, alluded to, in fact, dealt with in a very interesting way yesterday. This is the oration of Pericles uh, that appears in the history of the Peloponnesian War written by Thucydides. Uh, this is a speech that he delivered in honor of the fallen Athenians, the funeral oration, which is a classical description of citizenship, and it is addressed to perhaps the first police in history to resemble our own, as Professor Ray said yesterday. It is delivered to an assembly of free citizens during the first winter of the Peloponnesian War. It contains memorable descriptions of the paradox that we confront as citizens in a country like ours. First, it must seem strange, but it is true that the sheer dynamism of a free society can result inexorably in such an expansion of power and reach of interest, that challenge and reaction, such as Athens faced in the fifth century BC, become inevitable. Another dilemma. Isn't it tragic or ironic that citizens, Athenians, who have everything to lose, uh, <clears throat> who enjoy the fruits of success in so favored of a, of a country, must now be faced with a necessity of risking all for something so ephemeral as honor. Did, did they have choices in the fifth century? Pericles says, quote, make up your minds that happiness depends upon being free and that freedom depends on courage. Let there no, be no relaxation in the face of the perils of war. That speech continues in a way that uh, I find interesting. Let me say that our system of government does not copy the institutions of our neighbors, he continues. It is more of a case of our being a model to others. Our constitution is called a democracy because power is in the hands not of a minority but of the whole people. When it is a question of settling private disputes, everybody is equal before the law. When it is a question of putting one person before another in positions of public responsibility, what counts is not membership of a particular class but ability. Here, each one of our citizens in all the manifold aspects of life is able to show himself the rightful lord of his own person. Here, each individual is interested not only in his own affairs, but in the affairs of state as well. This is a peculiarity of ours. We do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say he has no business here at all. The, this is an invocation of the traits I think that are important uh, to appreciate as privileged citizens, as Athenian citizens certainly were in that era. This is a description of uh, what Professor Ray called, I think, nomo, uh, the ethic uh, that binds free individuals together as they're forming a phalanx, uh, mutually interdependent uh, and yet individually free. And at the heart of all of this is uh, this elusive quality we call courage. Thus Pericles spoke in 431 BC at the beginnings of the Peloponnesian War, which is but a short interlude uh, in history. In fact, the story of Athens is a rather short one. And so the history of Athens inspires as it warns, and this is one reason why I think uh, all of us as historians are fond of that book, as Professor Ray uh, covered yesterday. And the defeat, as the defeat of Athens shows, political eras come and go. The permanency of any country or any institutionalized way of life is an illusion, or perhaps more accurately described as an aspiration. How long can the United States retain her considerable stature today, 
gained as a result of World War II, among other things, is a question we ask, and it remains to be seen. But Americans can derive confidence that in recent times, uh, that unlike emerging Athens in antiquity, the principles espoused and defended by the United States have a large and growing following. Americans' values are accepted in the world far more, uh, far more uh, over far greater reaches uh, than they were in 1945. Whether American sponsorship of those values uh, is accepted or not. To see the commonalities, uh, to understand what it is that we have in common with others, to be able to define universals, these are things which the subject of World War II permit us to do, and I think that these are good things. These are things that we say uh, <clears throat> uh, we want to do with education. World War II provides a vision of a world that we say that we want to live in. It demonstrates the kinship in the toughness of free peoples everywhere. Uh, to paraphrase Eisenhower's address at Guild Hall, he did not express a hope in this uh, culminating address in June of 1945 that a citizen of Abilene, Kansas and a citizen of London, England, separated by distance, size, and history uh, were linked by a common dedication to freedom of worship, equality before the law, the liberty to act and speak as one saw fit, subject only to the provisions that one not trespass on the similar rights of others. He was stating these things as proven facts, facts proven in the European war, facts proven in dozens of battlefields of that war and in dozens of theaters from Burma to the Po River Valley. With ups and downs, international trends since World War II have moved in this direction. Again, World War II provides a vision of the world that we say we want and the world, in fact, that we are moving towards, perhaps the world that we are living in. If the demands of that world are less rigorous, and we speculated about that yesterday, perhaps it is sufficient to say the people who fought in one World War II planned it that way. Their intended bequest to us was a better world, and we happen to be taking advantage of that now. If the inner, the obvious qualities that are required to fight a war uh, are perhaps not required of us today, uh, we do have names for those qualities. They are evidenced in daily life, even if less dramatically, uh, as we go about life's challenges. A point made yesterday was that our independence, our right and our ability to govern ourselves depend on certain traits of citizenship and it depends upon historical memory. And I think that our successes as part of our historical heritage must be embraced as our failures are understood. And so I think that we can resolve today that on the subject of World War II and its meanings, that we as educators dare not shut that door on our past. We cannot shut that door on our past. And so I would say I feel certain that we will not shut that door on our past. It is a great subject. It should be taught. It should be taught in all of its dimensions. Uh, and I think that that is something that we can resolve and agree upon today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, David. We We're have a few here, minutes right? for questions. Yes, good morning. Um, I'd like to challenge uh, the notion a little bit that that door is being shut and that uh, the teaching of military history is on the wane. I think most of our students are uh, super anxious to study World War I and World War II. I know in my own case, my curriculum covers, uh, I teach world history from hunters and gatherers to the Renaissance, but after I finish that curriculum and testing is over, I can uh, jettison to something else. and. Uh, I had a student on the first day of school this year walk in and say, when are we getting to World War I? You know, so I think there's a, a huge interest and they're very anxious to learn military history. On the other hand, I think uh, that this is a tricky time 
to be good at teaching military history because of the current conundrum uh, that our military is in right now. So I'd like to just throw you, Professor Eisenhower, for a minute. Uh, you're a high school teacher of current events. Give us some guidelines on how to teach current military history. And, uh, Jeez, I, you know, I, I teach, uh, well, my dodge on that is that I'm a communications uh, teacher, not a military uh, uh, affairs uh, uh, <clears throat> teacher, and so uh, I'm not sure what my, but you know, my experience parallels yours exactly. Uh, as I say, yesterday's session came as a surprise in many ways because uh, uh, I find that uh, uh, dealing with war communications and topics of the war, uh, what I find is that these offerings at University of Pennsylvania, I think Walter alluded to this yesterday, are very popular. Uh, there's a great uh, uh, curiosity uh, about uh, military affairs and, uh, <clears throat> and a, a desire to develop, see, I'm not sure how I would advise teaching military history, but I think uh, uh, I can say uh, what it signifies or, or what it accomplishes. Military history, as I see it, uh, provides a capacity to understand a conflict uh, and uh, various histories that we need to understand. And we need to understand World War II. I think that's uh, a point. Uh, as a people, we need to understand the sources of our dynamism of our abilities, what we offer the world, we have to understand those sources as well as our uh, weaknesses. World War II provides a, a way of understanding that, and I don't think that World War II can um, uh, really be uh, usefully understood uh, without understanding something uh, about the military. That was a lot of fun yesterday, by the way, watching the PowerPoint uh, uh, presentation on the Western Front. It's been a while since I've uh, spent time with the subject of uh, World War II in a professional way. I haven't written about it uh, in a long time, a couple of articles here and there. But uh, I have to say the uh, facts of that war, as I was able to assemble them, uh, the record that I encountered in researching it, I feel I, I can almost remember it all by heart. It was so vivid. Uh, and it's fun to... Uh, it was very fun to watch that yesterday. And this is uh, uh, something that uh, I think the attitude I would take if I were given an opportunity to teach military affairs is this is something not only that you need to know, this is something that you're going to want to know. This is uh, uh, an exciting story and it's central uh, to uh, everything we know and understand today. I teach 20th century history to high school students. I'm on an interdisciplinary team with an English teacher and one of his big focuses is rhetoric. So my question to you is, um, what are the top three must reads for my 17 year olds for um, 20th century US history that we can focus on rhetoric as well and what should I make sure they get out of those speeches? Speeches, top three speeches? Yeah, 20th century US. Oh, good one. Good question. Incidentally, uh, <clears throat> um, a friend of mine at Texas A&M, in fact, my successor on the podium here is uh, from Texas A&M, Martin Medhurst, uh, running a, uh, a rhetoric project now at Baylor University, conducted a, a poll, in fact, invited me to participate in this, uh, top 100 speeches delivered by Americans in the 20th century. And uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a fascinating list. And uh, uh, I think that what you look for I'm not sure what you look for. What you look for in a speech, uh, it seems to me, is a great truth and uh, a speech that inspires action uh, in light of that truth. I think that uh, people would not be surprised to uh, know that, uh, uh, that the top 20th century speech is uh, ranked by rhetoric professors was I Have a Dream mm -hmm. uh, by Martin Luther King. That is certainly uh, Walter. And I have speculated about this uh, seamlessly at lunch and so forth. Martin Luther King is a sort of 20th century uh, Abraham Lincoln. Many people have contended uh, for that honor. Uh, <clears throat> Bill Clinton calls, uh, who's just been interviewed incidentally by a member of our project, uh, calls uh, Martin Luther King the greatest uh, 20th century American. That's another struggle. Uh, that is a struggle, by the way, uh, which uh, I would say emanates uh, from World War II. Interesting thing about World War II is that um, one of the interesting 
uh, traits of American dynamism that is apparent in World War II is that Americans uh, did not know limitations. Uh, <clears throat> we were undeterred by conventional military wisdom that the channel was too great a, a hurdle to sustain uh, a major invasion. Uh, Americans uh, were unimpressed by, by the idea that uh, we could not sustain a, mil a major military effort uh, to the Far East uh, on the scale uh, that we did. We simply did that anyway. And that attitude carries over into, uh, it's the foundation for the civil rights uh, movement and the great advances of the 1960s. Uh, because if you're a realist uh, about everything in human affairs, realistically, races live apart. Realistically, uh, the racial divide is very meaningful. Uh, but Americans are motivated by a faith uh, that the world can be as it ought to be. And that's what World War II certainly demonstrates uh, in a practical way. And it's a soaring idea that Martin Luther King articulates in that speech. There were two more speeches. Two more, that's a good oh, uh, two more. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, That's a very good question. I, uh, well, that's a terrible question to ask of me because I've got so many speeches that are uh, at the ready. I would say uh, the top three speeches that were uh, by, ranked by rhetoric professors were that one, uh, the Kennedy inaugural of 1961, uh, which I think is the classical post-war affirmation of citizenship. It's a speech about citizenship, and I think our conference this uh, uh, weekend has been about citizenship. Uh, that is a great declaration about citizenship, and that is what I would look to that speech uh, to say. And Franklin Roosevelt's uh, uh, speech in 1933 is inaugural. All we have to fear is fear itself. Uh, uh, underscoring, again, it seems to me, a lesson of World War II. What separates a country like the United States from uh, countries overseas, a successful society from uh, other societies uh, overseas. I have a former student uh, who is uh, currently working uh, in the government in Washington. Uh, for a time he was advancing trips for the Secretary of Treasury uh, and the Secretary of Commerce and these were trips that they were taking to Asia and Africa. Uh, we were talking on the phone throughout the first Bush term. He was just somebody who wanted to uh, share it. He knew that I had had uh, association with uh, politics in Washington. Many years, I wasn't sure my experience was that relevant, but at any rate, uh, as a student, uh, and I'm, I'm a teacher, we had a wonderful, uh, and have a wonderful relationship. But I remember Jeremy returning from Asia, and he says, you know what impresses me about uh, visiting these places, this is Central Asia and so forth, is that I think there is uh, one thing that separates us from them. And it's a difference that I see everywhere I go. And that difference is a simple word, confidence. Americans have confidence in their future, and they act differently uh, as a result, and that is the difference between America and everywhere else. Uh, I go at least uh, uh, overseas to advance for the secretary. I thought that was a really striking remark, and that is the theme of Franklin Roosevelt's great inaugural. That defeat is a state of mind. Success and everything we want to achieve in the world is a state of mind uh, that we can will or intend ourselves to level, levels of achievement that we don't think are possible. So these are three great speeches and there are many others. I'm sure I've gone over time. I've gone over time. Thank you very much. Thanks.